Hello and welcome to episode 60 of Lifestyle Pirates. You're live with Big J and Adriano. Hello. This episode we are live here with Dr. Florence Cottell. Good evening, Florence. Good evening. Thank uh, you very much for having me. How Thank are you? Thank you very much for coming. I am very excited. I'm pretty excited as well because you're a neuroscientist, you're an endurance athlete, an inspirational speaker, and a founder of Bliss Science. So before we get into Bliss Science... How do you get into an endurance athlete in there? How did you get that on your business card? Mm. Um, I love sport. I'm pretty, I'm, I would say, addicted to mm. endurance sport. And I find that I have learned a lot of lessons, uh, life lessons through sport. And I add this on my business card because I think it shows that I'm somebody that can manage long-term projects. And uh, if mm. you're very ambitious and you want to go far, that's very important. So what classifies something as endurance? Um, so examples or whatever? Yeah, I do long distance triathlon. So mm -hmm. I do Ironman, uh, which would correspond to 140 miles. That corresponds to endurance. That, that, that At once? Doubled. Yes. <laughs> uh, like Swimming, without bikes cycling, or anything. running. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm out. So no, not motored. Nothing for motor or anything. <laughs> um, it's, it's not the time My legs on. and my mind. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Definitely What's powered by motivation and fun. So how long of it, so for an endurance, obviously the first, maybe the first couple of kilometers are fine. After that, is it all mind? Like, how does it work? Because for me, if I knew, actually I did an 80 kilometer walk once, just a walk. It happened to be a 40 plus day. Um, degrees and I work, walked from Manly to Bondi halfway through I was like why am I doing this this is the dumbest like I've, I'm not proving anything to anyone why am I doing this and I just wanted to quit but then my brother met me halfway and he's like well we've got to do it now <laughs> so that yeah but so I was ready to give up and it's not that I was dead like I was walking but I was just like no nah, I, I can give up right now why am I, why am I doing this you're good bored. Yeah. I've ha I have that each time I run a marathon. Yeah. I think from kilometer 36, I enter this kind of mood where I'm thinking, this is my life now. I will just be running forever. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is the moment when um, you really find something inside you mm. uh, to go for further mm. and keep on going and motivate yourself and remember the end goal. I always yep. remember myself. I, I always f imagine myself going through the finish line mm -hmm. and that gives me energy because I want the kick, I want the joy mm. that I will have when I finally reach my goal. And that's exactly this that I use in my everyday life in every project. Mm. Uh, when it becomes too hard, I imagine myself finishing, succeeding, I want that, and that's going to give me energy to go through all the obstacles. So what sort of challenges do you have on those on those sort of endurance runs? What kind of challenges? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, I suppose mentally. Like, so for me, I was like, you know, I was just no reasoning for doing it. Um, do you have challenges of like, why am I doing this? Or yeah. um. So my story is that at 25, mm. I moved to Denmark, Copenhagen, mm -hmm. which is basically the city of bicycles. I had never, ever been on a bicycle, mm -hmm. on a saddle. And I, I was a bit ashamed I didn't dare to tell my colleagues and my friends mm -hmm. that I couldn't cycle mm -hmm. like they did. So I taught myself at yeah. night, yeah, hiding. Yeah. <laughs> and four years later, I cycled from north to south of South America, 12,000 mm -hmm. kilometers, uh, actually on a bicycle that I built. And so, <laughs> sorry. So you went, you went from Paris because that's your homeland. That's you're, my you're home. originally French. Well, you're still French. Um, <laughs> <laughs> good shout, Big J. Um, you went from Paris to Denmark, learn how to cycle, then cycle twelve thousand miles. The twelve thousand kilometers in South America from Quito to Ushuaia. Yeah, doing well, like sleeping in the wild. Not always, but often. <laughs> through the Andes. Do you realise you lost us about five minutes ago when you said past 36 kilometres? Like yeah. Adrian and I know both, both just kind of glazed over on that one. Um, what, what drove oh, you to wow. that? Um, the sensation of conquering what I thought I may not be able to do. Okay. And I get a lot of joy out of pushing my own limits, my own boundaries. Mm. 
I feel like we need another episode because I know we're going to talk <laughs> about something very specific today. We need another chat on this. Um, far out, okay. And so when you completed that, how did that feel? Um, I'm not sure I have words. I was definitely very emotional and yeah. it's been 10 years now and I can still remember the moment when I was about to like cross, <laughs> like like see the, the sign of Ushuaia, which was my goal. Um, I remember the emotions. It really, I felt, I think I felt very grateful to the 25 year old that uh, tried to like, try to believe in herself yeah. when it seemed pretty crazy. <laughs> and have you kept on your endurance sports since? Since yes. I guess since moving down under as well, have you kept doing some of these, some of these things? Yes, because I really discovered that pushing my limits is something that I love. So as soon as I identify your limit, mm. I'm gonna try to push it. <laughs> Far out. Okay. So this is like the complete opposite of what we're going to talk about now, right? Not so much, actually. Oh, here we Maybe go. Maybe that's. <laughs> That was a. That's like the big message before we even start talking about it. I love that. That was big, That's Jay. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, for the audience today, we are going to be talking about burnout. Mm. Now, um, burnout. I wanted to talk about this, or we want to talk about this before it became a hashtag and just a cliche all over the world. So, and I think for me, um, Florence. Can I call you Florence, or is it Doctor Cartel? What would you prefer? Florence is great. Florence, but okay. thank you very much for mentioning the title. It gets very often skipped for women, okay. and it's important that it's mentioned. Okay. Why is that? You have to ask the people that uh, somehow mm. forget yeah. <laughs> to use the title for women, but always remember for men. Mm -hmm. I, from my side, that would just be an observation yeah. and a habit that I've had. I gave a talk at um, the headquarters of a multinational mm -hmm. bank mm -hmm. talking to leaders about leadership, mm -hmm. and I was introduced as Florence on stage. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you got a PhD. Yeah, I yeah. have a PhD. Yeah. Exactly, address me as doctor. Can I ask, did you correct said introducer? I didn't even realize it on the moment. Mm. Um, oh. And that's when I was sent the video of the event and they wanted to share it with more and more people. And then I realized there wasn't even there wasn't even my last name. There was just Florence. Just Florence. Just regular Florence. And I asked them at least to then add my name, like add um, a first slide to mm. the to the video uh, to introduce myself with my last name and mm. the title. Yeah. And they said I was really asking for much. What? Yes. <laughs> so can you include our full name? <laughs> right, okay, far out. Okay, well, Dr. Florence Cottel, it is a pleasure <laughs> to have you. you on the podcast on Lifestyle Pirates. So we're talking about burnout today. Um, now, look, for many of us, we are just coming out of lockdown here in Australia. I would say we've probably had a bit of a silent lockdown in, in 2022. But I would say there's a lot of us that probably feel more fatigued than ever. What are you seeing in your space? I very much agree with you. Um, not just... I've, had, I've made the same observation that people are not just... Um, fatigued as if they were uh, lacking a few nights of sleep. Mm. They have this deep sense of emotional exhaustion. There are many more people that have this deep sense of emotional exhaustion that typically um, would not be solved by a two-week holiday. Mm. It's something that yeah, is much deeper. And so for the for the un, uninitiated or unlearned, um, what is burnout? So... Um, it's not a medical condition, and there are lots of people that think that. It is a syndrome, and it has been um, formulated that way by the World Health Organization. Yeah. And it is a syndrome that is um, entirely linked to an occupational phenomenon. Mm. And it occurs when uh, chronic stress is not managed at work for a long time. Um, I imagine we want to talk about the signs. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, you've taken half my notes because I had the I had the WHO quote uh, that referred to it as an occupation because it's not a medical. It's not actually classified as a medical syndrome, is it, or a medical disease? Yes. It's it's, it's a phenomenon, which is phenomenon. insane. The reason for this is that um, as soon as you classify something as medical condition, there can be a lot of reimbursement issues or. Um, uh, uh, sick leaves involved, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, depending on countries. 
So there so also it's monetary is reason. It, no, but it, um, what I mean is that the wording mm. can have a lot of consequences. Okay. And so at the moment, I think if I just say very simply, burnout s- w- started to be um, well studied, I would say, 50 years ago, which in a research point of view is really not so long ago. Mm. And we still have a lot to understand. And so it would have seemed a bit um, early mm to uh, classify it as a medical condition when there is so little that we know about it, in a way. Because I was reading, actually, so it was in the 1970s, I think they referred to it, they found it was more in social workers that it was occurring, um, and it was because of their workload. So it seems to be a a phenomenon that's been um, kind of rearing its head over the last, as you say, kind of 50 years, and now it's, it's coming to edge probably because we've been not seeing each other for a long time and and being efficient and working online for a long time. Yes. So I would say that at the moment we're seeing more and more cases and people are really experiencing it Mm -hmm. because we had, um, or a lot of people had some kind of system of a community, of a group, uh, close friends, loved ones that were surrounding them on a daily basis that were helping them to cope with stress. And with lockdowns, we've been separated, we've been isolated. And so for the exact same situation, the exact same stress, if you don't have the factor that helps you go through stress, you will experience it in a much more amplified way. And I think this is really what we're seeing uh, post lockdowns. It's really the fact that we had to handle even greater stressors with way less support. Mm. And that doesn't go in the right way. So you said it was occupational stress, not the amount of time that you work. Yes. Okay. And that's um, that's a very important point, mm. I would say, because um, a lot of people, we hear constantly uh, about work-life balance yeah. and the idea that if you work less, you're not going to be stressed as much. Um, however, there are many people that feel very very strong effects of stress, yeah. even if they work, I would say, just nine to five. And I don't want to mean that it's not much, yeah, yeah. but by that I mean that they're even without working extra hours, mm. people can feel that. And um, uh, on the opposite side, it's same that just telling people to work less mm. is not going to solve yeah. their burnout issues at okay. all. And that's if there's one message, actually, that I want to share it's that work-life balance is not going to save you from burnout. It's not going to make you recover from burnout. Um, and we can talk more about mm. why. But that's that would really be my message. What you need is to get excited and, um, and have the sensation that you're moving forward something, achieving something that you deeply care about. Um, you you talked about the first studies about burnout in the um, 1970s. Uh, the first book that was published about burnout is called The Cost of Caring. And we, th- we used to think that it was really people that had occupations that were carers. Mm. Uh, the first book is actually about um, wards on, uh, in uh, prisons. Um, but the, the phenomenon was really uh, very quickly observed for teachers that care for their students, for doctors that care, medical doctors that care for their patients, or nurses that care for their patients. And uh, now we can kind of generalize to the, f- the concept that it, it touches anybody that deeply cares mm. about achieving something. And... The burnout starts when they get hit by a big disappointment and they start realizing that they're not moving mm. forward towards the ideal, what, what they really care about. If I take the example of nurses, that can be um, realizing that they simply do not have time to be nice with patients, to take their hands and discuss with them, that they just have to do everything that's on their to-do list um, mm. and that they would be there to provide medical care, but they won't be there to provide humane care. Mm. And a lot of nurses start get into that occupation because they, they love people and they want to help people. And they feel that even though they're working long hours, they're not helping. And this, this big disappointment w- could be the start of burnout. 
But a burnout is really an evolving phenomenon. Um, and it's not that people are fine one day and they wake up the next day and they're in deep burnout. It's, it really slowly progresses, which makes it very sneaky and more difficult to identify, therefore more difficult to prevent. That's fascinating that because I always considered – all right, for, for me, for example, I've yeah. been working like 15-hour days for the last couple of weeks, right? But I love what I do, right? So – and then I hear people that have got a nine-to-five job and they're burnt out. And I'm like, how, you know? Um, so it's really, really interesting that you've mentioned that. It's occupational stress, not the hours that you work. And, um, yeah, people have told me that I need to get work-life balance. It's like – but I don't. I'm, I'm quite happy doing what I'm, what I'm doing. So, yeah, that, that differentiation between burnt out and just exhausted, I guess, you know, because I am tired, yeah. but I wouldn't say I'm burnt out. I love what I do. I'd, I'd do it now if I could, you know. Um, thank you. I think that's a really good example. Mm. Um, I'll take another one. <laughs> so we've got a doctor taking notes now. <laughs> <laughs> Mechanic loves what he does. We'll write a case study on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's true. <laughs> um, if you imagine a singer or songwriter... Mm. You wouldn't be telling these people, stop writing songs all day long, stop singing all yeah. day long. Because yeah. they, it's very obvious, very intuitively obvious that they love what they do. Mm. And if they do it a lot, that will just make them happy. And um, now we use the word work as if it was something that was negative. Mm. If you work a lot, uh, ev- as if everybody was hating their work. Mm. I worked for universities as a researcher for many years and... I absolutely loved mm. what I was doing and I was working over 80 hours a week at some point and that was not a problem at all because just like you, I was having fun mm. <laughs> and I really didn't want anybody to take me out of the yeah. lab. And this is really um, a, an important message that um, what matters is the joy, the excitement and the sensation of achieving something that you get through your work. And if you don't have that, you need to find a way to mm. provide these sensations to yourself in your life. Mm-hmm. And that's when the work-life balance comes into play. If you have a wonderful life outside work, hobbies, mm. uh, things that you love doing that are going to make you just have the best time, mm. then yes, try to work a bit less and do that yeah. more. But that's that's not a work-life balance. That's... Uh, joy versus anything that sucks happiness Mm. out of you and if you think of it um we could transform work into something that actually enables you to fulfill Mm. your 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 needs um you don't necessarily need to find joy outside work Mm. there can there are lots of work that can provide you joy um it just comes to managers being able to create that and that is the issue of burnout in the end so it's really interesting. There's, there's a few things. So one of my take out, take outs from what you've just said is I can imagine a factory worker many, many years ago, so let's say working at General Motors, you know, an old metal sheet worker or something, their job would be so repetitive, literally repetitive, you know, pressing moulds, you know, into to metal. Mm. You can talk here. But would their, they wouldn't get burnout because they've got that kind of work environment where they're still with their colleagues, their friends, they get a break, they go smoke or whatever they want to do. And they wouldn't have big expectations. Mm. Right. They wouldn't arrive, start a job like this, and think, I'm here to change the world. Mm. Right. They would arrive and know, I'm here to screw. Uh, I'm here to push a button. And it's going to start at that time. It's going to stop at that time. And in between, this is what I'm going to do. There will be um, no mismatch between the expectation mm. and what happens. That's interesting. So, mm. so on that then, are, you, uh, are we seeing burnout in a lot of the younger generation that have this, you know, I want to change the world. I want to make an impact. I want to, I want to impress my boss in the first six months, 12 months, mm. rather than that kind of longevity. So are you finding that a lot of the younger generation are getting burnout because they're not hitting their personal goals or having the splash that they thought they would have yes there are many young people that experience burnout because they put a lot of pressure on themselves because what they care about is the level of their performance is their impact in society 
and they start new jobs thinking believing in the values that the company has uh, provided on their website and mm. thinking that changing oh, the world will nice be Nice stickers on the wall. Don't forget the nice stickers on the wall as well that they, oh, yes. you know, yeah, that you they know, put, yeah, integrity, absolutely. you know, put the customer first. Always. Hey, I'll put those up. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Isn't that a tattoo you've got? But yeah, exactly. But see, that's the thing. Um, I think to John's point, it's because we're handing out ninth place ribbons. You know, everyone comes into a job. It's like, oh, you know what? I've been told I'm the best. And you get to reality and it's like, nah, mate. You're just like all of the rest of us. You work hard and you'll get there. And you can be happy. I don't understand. You're like, you're like, oh, all these people are upset, burnt out. And it's like, man, just get on with it. Seriously. Sorry, John. We're having this conversation before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably the wrong person to talk about burnt out. Um, so, again, it's... It's people that deeply care mm. about something that will be affected. Mm. And if what they deeply care about is contributing to something or having the sensation that they're contributing to their best, maybe not to an ideal, but mm. at least to their direct environment. Mm. And they're put in situations where they're, they're not going to be the best for this or that reason very often because they were not explained exactly what the world would, what the work would be about. Mm. Uh, they're not given all the tools or they don't have access to all the education that they would have needed to perform to their best. And <laughs> magic. <laughs> some magic happening here. <laughs> there is indeed. <laughs> and, um, and when they are put in these type of situations where there's a mismatch between what they had imagined their performance would mm. be, their impact would be, and the reality, that's a big disappointment that starts a burnout. Mm. And then... Um, that's um, I would I would make two uh, big um, categories of burnout, just depending on the early stages and the late stages. The early stages would be this uh, big sensation of disappointment that mm. um, kind of decreases the motivation for work that mm. they used to love. It's always people that have less uh, motivation for something they used to love. If you don't have much motivation, but you hated your work since the start, you're not burned out. <laughs> yeah. You knew you were going to love it. You just don't like your life and you just change it. Yeah. <laughs> so Hamid, so just to distill that. So you're saying that people that turn up, and let's just say they do a nine to five. So th they are, um, they're just there for the salary. They don't want to make an impact and, and there's no, nothing wrong with these people. But they're, yeah. they're just there to, mm -hmm. to, to get a paycheck. They would traditionally suffer suffer burnout. But the people that live, eat, sleep, breathe a business, they're passionate, they want to move it forward, they want to make an impact, they want to make change, they're the ones that would traditionally suffer burnout. Yes, absolutely. And and that's because they want to make things happen, but nothing's happening. Um, not necessarily that nothing's happening. They have the sensation yep. that they are not that what they dream of is not going to happen or that maybe they are not contributing enough towards it. Yeah. So have you found that there's a personality type or a trait that would traditionally suffer from burnout? So typically the higher achievers would be th like the first ones to suffer. Um, but then there's also um, people that have... Um, people that kind of accept... Um, bad situations and uh, typically don't fight for themselves mm. would be uh, prone to burnout because, as I've explained, there I would make two categories, mm. the, the early and the late. And in the early phase, when you realize that there's a problem, there will be many people that just decide, F this, mm. I'm just going to leave. Uh, I don't like this situation. This is not for me and I will find something else. The people that typically don't fight for themselves because they don't feel entitled, because they don't feel worth it, they're going to stay in that in that bad situation, in that bad place. And they're going to be entering the late stages that are the deep stages of burnout. Mm. So perfectionism would be a trait that kind of pushes you <laughs> um, to the late stages and then people that really don't, don't uh, fight for themselves. How about entrepreneurs? Yeah, entrepreneurs are the, uh, are people that have an ideal. There's something they want to achieve, mm. and they are they are very high risks of burnout. Yes. Okay, so when you do see these signs, what's the best thing to do? Um, 
I think I should say that the f- um, typically people that are in burnout do not realize it uh, okay. for a long time. Mm-hmm. And very often it takes the help of <laughs> the surrounding to mm-hmm. realize uh, that there's something uh, not uh, good going on. Especially now that we hear about burnout all the time, there's all this misinformation, too much information, um, it and it and it, it's almost trendy now to be in burnout. Uh, so many people use this word uh, without really knowing it, what it is. It's the new busy, isn't it? Absolutely, it's the new busy. Yeah, and um, because the word itself is very symbolic, like burnt out, you can really imagine somebody that's been consumed by fire, and mm. um, it's like depressed. The, the words are used by everyone in very casual situations. And so lots of people would declare themselves burnt out when they are not. And the people that feel really, that have these um, sensations that they're not as productive anymore at work, they become cynical about the work, they they really lose motivation for something they used to love, and then they start to feel exhausted. They think that the problem comes from them. They don't think that the problem is situational or occupational, Mm -hmm. they always think that they're the one that do not perform well uh, up to the expectations. And that's why it takes a long time for them to realize. And very often it, it takes either that a very good conversation with people that they're very close with mm. or to go to late stages when um, the physical um, manifestation, uh, physical signs are so important that you can't, um, you can't not see. Uh, mm. see so, so what would some of the signs be? So if you're a, a partner or a colleague or a friend of something of someone with that's experiencing burnout yeah. or going through burnout or at the start like what what would some of those those signs So I would say the first thing is really the change in how the person talks about their work. Mm-hmm. Uh, when there was someone that was extremely if we take the um, example of an entrepreneur, the entrepreneur that was extremely excited by the new venture, the new project. Typically there's not just one project, there are a few <laughs> for entrepreneurs. Yeah, you know. they're normally plate spinners, yeah. Yeah. Um, that always had ideas, that was energetic. And when that person starts changing language and um, doesn't show as much interest, um, doesn't drive conversation towards typical things th- about their work that they were talking about. That's a first sign, actually. And I'm not talking about one or two days, one or two mm. conversations. I'm talking about across a few weeks. Yeah. Um, and then the depersonalization, be a person becoming very cynical about, uh, again, really something a that is linked to their occupation, to their work, mm-hmm. and Th- their own work or other people's work. Their so own work. Would you would you see them naturally start to withdraw in team meetings? Um, you know, if they're on Zoom, they've probably got their screen off because they, you know, they just they they don't want to be there. Like, is that the kind of stuff you see? Um, I think it would be. M- they would tend to be there more because right. they become a bit obsessed with the idea that they're not performing to their best. Right. And so the first reaction is actually to work even more mm. to compensate with their lack of productivity. And they enter this cycle where they actually, at, at first, they increase the amount of work that they uh, produce to compensate for their lack of productivity. And But at the same time, their motivation decreases. So it's really the language, the way they talk about what they're doing they work really, really hard towards something that they stop caring about. And then the, then they start isolating themselves. Um, they start doing things that they used to love, hobbies that they were doing on the side, they would stop doing them to work even more, again, to try to compensate for their lack of productivity. And if they stay in that situation, um, which is really a mismatch between the amount that they work for something that doesn't motivate them anymore, it doesn't provide any joy anymore, um, then they would start showing signs of exhaustion, which would be lack of memory, uh, up to a point where they can't remember any any. You, you, I would be if I was in deep burnout. I would be asking you three times the same questions mm. without realizing that I've actually just asked it within ten minutes. Mm. It's, it's, it becomes very, very hard to have any memory of some kind. Um, impossibility to focus. And the most simple email could take an hour to answer when it's just a simple question to answer. Um, and then the physical exhaustion. In very deep cases, people 
can't move anymore. They become even afraid to walk from their kitchen to their bedroom. Jesus. That's that in late stages don't look good. And that's why I would really make two the, the differentiation between the early stages and yeah. the late stages that really nobody uh, uh, that's that's what we should try to prevent as much as possible so what does what does the high street what does linkedin what does the layman what does the typical boss typical colleague think burnout is what's their connotation their their understanding yeah that it's weak people that can't go through stress and that um, it's people that, um, if they worked a bit less, would just uh, complain less and uh, feel good. Right. I very much disagree with the streamline. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, you've actually written a lot of papers around burnout. Yes, absolutely. W- what's, what's the feedback been? And I'm intrigued by this, so I'm, I'm going to ask on two levels. So from your peer group, so other doctors and, and people in your peers, and then I guess people in, in Adriano and, and I's world of, of young professionals. <laughs> what's what's the level of feedback that you've got? And what's the, what's the um, I guess, recognition that this is something, that this isn't a phenomenon, this is very real? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say um, among scientists, it's very obvious that this is very real. Um, there are more and more people that are working on it. The difficulty of um, harnessing the exact definition of it, categorizing it, is uh, real, and scientists are very much aware of it. And this is why there are lots of studies that contradict each other, because um, any study would need to rely on um, the diagnosis of burnout, and at the moment, not everybody agrees on who to put in that box and who doesn't fit in that box. Yeah, is that and a GP? Is that the manager? Is that your colleague? Like, it depends on situations. An forum, and yeah. there are lots of studies that have b- that are done based on um, people self-identifying as burned out or not. And and at the same time, we know that, as I've explained, people can't really, like typically the ones that really suffer from burnout, they don't really know. And the ones that use it and say they're burnt out, very often they're not. So we know that those studies, and there are many of them, that are based on basically um, patient feedback Mm. are not very reliable. And so we really are at a time where we're trying to um, develop even further the tests to have a very robust test. At the moment, everything is based on feedback, like answers to very generic questions. Um, and it would require a professional and someone that ha- that is an expert in burnout mm. to really make a diagnosis. And not many, because it's still very like recent, mm. not many medical doctors have had the proper education on it. Mm-hmm. So it's difficult. It, not every GP would be able to diagnose it properly. Uh, not every psychiatrist. It's it's still very young. But uh, one thing is sure is that there are more and more um, scientists that are trying to find the biological markers. If there's something that we can mm. uh, study within the brain or within the stress axis, that would be a way to make an objective diagnosis. Uh, but we're not there yet. So you mentioned before about the categories of the early stages and the later stages. Um, so what sort of conversation should you be having to people if you do see the sort of early categories or the early stages of um, burnout? Is it as simple as, you know, watching a Tony Robbins uh, stand-up inspirational sort of speech? Like, is it mindset? Can you get over burnout with mindset? Can you just program your mind into it? Because it's clear that it's not exhaustion. It's more of a, you know, stress-related thing and... Yeah, like what sort of conversations do you have with those people? I have conversations around what they love, Mm -hmm. what gives them joy, how much joy they get on their daily life, Mm -hmm. and what could provide them with more joy. It's it's really a phenomenon to see a lot of people that are very unhappy about what they're doing and are at early stages of burnout that start a side hassle. And when they're everybody t- is telling them stop working so much, they they work even more, but they start working on something that gives them a lot of joy. And that's that the way we talk about the creative juices. If people aren't being creative at work, they then kind of put that somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. And um, 
typically people that want to use their creativity, that gives them a lot of joy to work on a side hassle that would be, I don't know, painting and selling their paintings on a market. Like doing, a podcast. Doing a podcast <laughs> is a fantastic <laughs> example. And and basically it it feeds you with it feeds you and fills you with energy instead of sucking it hmm. from you. And um, if you imagine like that you have a bucket and um, any situation that is very stressful is emptying it. You have to provide to yourself situations and surround yourself with people that would enable you to refill it. And if your work really is sucking everything out of your bucket, you have to find the, 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 um, the way to go, the, the cure, the treatment, the solution is to find something that provides you with joy, excitement, and that makes you feel that you're achieving something that you care about. That's super interesting because I had a friend of mine, he used to travel a lot for work. And in COVID, that travel obviously got, you know, kiboshed. It was just it was a non-starter for obvious reasons, and that's when he found his work very challenging, because I guess the the seasoning on his job was traveling interstate and internationally and you know, loving life and seeing his team all over the world. As soon as that got taken away, it kind of highlighted the day today was pretty mum- mundane, and and that was then tough. And then you had the the zoom seasoning on that and then you had the i get up and i live in my own flat and i go to sleep in my own flat and i work in my own flat and i'm having arguments i'm having conflicts with my colleagues in my own flat yeah that's that's very interesting that you said about that yeah and um I, i've said a lot of uh, negative things about work-life balance what is important about it is balance yeah. everything that we do should be balanced and balance and is subjective as well right mm-hmm. and um when we work from home when we well sleep at home, eat at home, do everything at home, nothing is balanced. Mm. You really feel at, at the end of the day, you have just one thing at the very center of your life. And mm. if this one thing doesn't go well, it, you'll feel that your entire life mm. is uh, not going well. And having some kind of balance in everything that you do is important just as a protection for yourself. This is why I find it quite challenging for people that are quite happy to work from home. And I get people have different uh, rituals, routines. But for me, I kind of go, if you have a shit meeting at four till five online with a colleague or a client or a team, and you literally have to shut your laptop or turn your computer off, and then you have to turn around, go down the stairs or turn around if you're in a flat and face your family or face your partner, how do you get the moment to come down and decompress from that? And if you and, and again and the same, if you wake up in the morning, you have a coffee. How do you get the time to build yourself up for the day? If you've then got to maybe talk to your team or talk to a colleague, talk to a customer. It's very very difficult to distill, and then all of a sudden your home, which is where it's normally it's a safe place, mm-hmm. it's where your kids are, it's where you know, your wine is, that kind of stuff. But oh, that yeah. then becomes very toxic, mm-hmm. and that can be a kind of vicious cycle down as well as so i'm i'm intrigued by people that are really happy with this work from home ritual um and it, and it concerns me for the long term genuinely i'm not somebody that particularly enjoys working from home if it's in my uh, <laughs> um forever life mm. um but there are tricks for it um my trick is that uh, um between the moment that I wake up and I'm, I love my coffee too and I'm having coffee and doing whatever I like to do in the morning and the moment that I start working, I have a ritual. For me, it's a shower and I put makeup on and I put business clothes on. Mm, yeah. And this is when I switch, I would say. And I even switch like places from home. I, I do not work in the same area than I would live. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. And I would do the reverse when I stop working. And it's important, it can be a good tool to have rituals. Uh, and there can be any kind of thing. Um, there can be just a few exercises. There can be putting um, a song and dancing. Mm. Uh, I mean, you're at home. You can do, th- there's things that you can do when you're at home that you would not do in an office. Mm. So that's the moment to just take the opportunity and go crazy. I don't know. There's some stupid adverts on TV where they're dancing in the office. Uh, well, that's, that's I don't my, watch TV, so do, that's why do, I don't know. Do you ever get your mechanics that dance in there? We always do, every morning, 10.05. 10.05? Yeah, to 10.10. 10. 
Every oh. morning. What do you dance to? Uh, Andrea Bocelli. Oh, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, th- th- you raise a really good point. You're basically saying subconsciously you need to, if you're working from home, you need to acknowledge your home and work balance with a ritual or a marker, be that wear corporate wear, um, have a tune, have a, you, so you're kind of saying have your boundaries and make that whatever you feel comfortable with. Absolutely, to establish this balance that we were talking about. Um, the fact that when you close your computer, or close your notebook, close mm. the door of your garage, all the worries that are um, linked to work mm-hmm. stay there. Mm-hmm. And a ritual is really what's going to enable you to have those different spaces cohabit and uh, live together mm. at your home if you have to be at your home uh, on, on every day. So Adriana asked a question earlier on about how as a, as a work, as a team or a manager or a colleague at work, um, you can help someone that's in a journey. Uh, and I use the germ journey because there will be a, an ending to it. How about for a husband, wife, a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, friend, how would you have that conversation with someone that you feel is maybe in stage one or stage two, as you've talked about, mm-hmm. of burnout? Again, it's a lot about... What makes you happy? Mm. And um, do you still enjoy doing this? Mm. Um, what what would joy be like? And what would provide you with this joy? Um, do you want to change situation? Or do you want your situation, your surrounding to change? Um, and I think for people that don't realize that they are in burnout and they are going deeper, it's important to say that they are doing a great job, Mm. that uh, they deserve to be happy, that they should not feel extremely guilty for their performance, that in most cases they're they're still doing really fine. Uh, They're just putting a lot of pressure and expectations on themselves and reminding them that they are entitled to happiness, that they're worth something. And and have these conversations about what will make them happy, what would make them happy, uh, how to transform their life so that they can get this happiness. I think that's um, hmm. um, for people that are in the in the obsession zone about their work. Uh, it's useless to tell them work less because they will just you will become their enemy, and they will stop talking to you. If the, the typical sentence that you hear is people that would answer, you, don't, you just don't get it. And um, yeah, you don't because <laughs> you have different uh, mm. interests in life. Um, but they would, be, they would have very strong reactions and they would like stop conversation. Uh, so it's very important to just listen to them and remind them that they are doing great, uh, that they are worth it, that... Um, they are entitled to joy and that they are they are always solutions for them to get joy typically we say that um, people that go through clinical depression feel hopeless and people that go through burnout they feel helpless they feel there's n- there's no help there's no other situation um, they cannot they cannot change because this is this and that reason and it's good to help them see that Yes, there are challenges, but they can, they can face them. Mm. So say that again. So burnout leads to. Uh, so so, so people, depression, sorry, depression. Depression. Yeah, is hopeless. Yeah, people feel hopeless and burnout. People feel helpless. So out of interest, do you have you seen that people have burnout? It leads to depression. So yes. they go from feeling helpless to things are hopeless. Yes, absolutely. Very late stages. Not the other way around. Um. It's it's even beyond being being hopeless, is beyond feeling helpless. Meaning that um, when someone feels hopeless, they think that even if they get if they had the best help, nothing would get better. Yeah. In burnout, there are still people that are in deep phases of burnout. They're still able to experience joy, mm. um, and typically they would be kind of okay when they try to stay away from what stresses them. Yeah. So they but, would have triggers, right? But as soon as they think of their work, yeah. as soon as they're getting close to the computer 
or on the way to work, just like they close the door of their flat and they start walking to work, then their mood would entirely change. That's when they would not have memory anymore. That's when they would not have attention anymore. And that's why there's some kind of sense of guilt that many people describe because they're thinking, five minutes ago, I was fine. Mm. I'm just making this up. Mm. If, if now, just because I'm on my way to work, I feel like shit, I'm just making it up. And it takes a long time to accept that you know, this is their biology. This is a real thing. They're not the only one that, that goes through it. So appreciating your comment earlier, on, this has only been doing kind of for 50 years. Yeah. Have we, I say we, ha- have, has the medical community kind of, um, I guess almost documented a cycle? Not, not to try and gamify it or, or anything, but like is there a cycle that you see people with burnout go through and and what does the end look like and are we are we talking a couple of weeks are we talking months are we talking years um do they have to change job like what's the i don't say remedy because i think i think everybody will have their own remedy but like how what what are you seeing from a a journey said a lot of very important and interesting things well thank you Um, (laughs) you. i do my best (laughs) It's working. First time. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 60 Episode and I'm insightful. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, it's not a one size fits all. And everybody has to find a solution that would fit them. And that's that's very important. It's not because you read an article about with like five bullet points on how to get better, how to oh. recover about burnout. Yeah. You have to find your own way. And this requires life changes that are not necessarily changing work um, if your work is happy to change with you i would say if your manager is happy to um, maybe give you a different position or um, offer you the right um, training that would empower you to do even better or feel that you're doing even performing even better at your work Um, another thing is that for late cases of burnout it takes years to recover and the, the, um, the most advanced stages, um, there's some uh, medical doctors that think that people never fully recover. I want to think, as uh, a neuroscientist, we're, we're very, um, can we, s- we can see how the brain can transform itself mm. in good and bad. And um, I think that we can recover from most things, but it takes, the there, there are some studies that, kind of um, suggest that it would take seven years, uh, up to seven years, eight years to recover from uh, late stages. Uh, Other people would say that typically it takes double the time that people stayed in a late burnout. Um, So it's important to accept that the process is going to take a long time we're going to go back to endurance. Mm. Process is going to take a long time and you have to accept to be patient. And in endurance, when you would train for an, a long event, we always say, trust your training. Because uh, there will be moments where you really don't want to run anymore. You really don't want to uh, pedal anymore. And you feel you're not progressing. And you're asking yourself, why am I doing mm. this? And that's when you have to tell yourself, trust your training. Your training is working for you. Mm. And when you're on your journey to recover from burnout, that's when you have to remember, trust the process. You're taking care of more, uh, you're m- taking more care of yourself. Um, you're doing things to provide yourself with more joy, surrounding yourself with people that make you laugh, doing things that get you excited, that enable you to feel that you're getting closer to your goals. And this is slowly changing your biology and it's important to trust the process. The good things are happening, but they take time. I love that. Mm. My question to you now then is, if you have, as an individual, if you've recognized that you are in a stage of burnout, because you said that we recognize it later on, then it's already kind of crept in. Is that something you would publicize to your colleagues, your peers, your boss? And and I guess almost ask for help. Would you Would you let them know to maybe talk to you differently, treat you differently, I guess seek those words of encouragement? Because I can imagine... In the same way that we're trying to navigate if we have burnout 
and we don't know what it is, like it's been only around for 50 years, right? You've got companies that don't know how to treat someone and acknowledge and engage with someone with burnout. And let alone face-to-face, but over Zoom because it might be a global company. So how does someone in a workforce say to their colleagues, their peers, their boss, hey, look, I'm, yeah, I'm done. Again, a very good point because uh, it's it's very tricky because there is still um, this idea that people that are burnt out are weak. And so Lazy obviously... And lazy. Yes. And yeah. so obviously you really don't want to, uh, to have your colleagues or your managers have this opinion of you. Mm. So um, the answer really depends on your, your work surrounding. Um, there are more and more... Uh, HR departments that have some qualifications in handling burnout and that also put at the center of their management techniques the person's values. And um, if if it's the case, then I would um, suggest to discuss the, val- the employee's values. person go to their manager or I think HRs, um, HR officers would be um, more equipped uh, to have this kind of discussions, um, discussing about what what the employee really cares about, what they really want to achieve, and find how through their work they can achieve it, because that's going to take you out of burnout. And if you are in a situation where the management is really like refractory to all these ideas. Um, you can always try. It's always there's uh, it. If you're not too exhausted, emotionally exhausted, it's worth trying. Um, if you try and you feel that uh, you're hitting a wall, then it's good to think of a change. And again, it will be important to remember trust your process. If you're on a new journey, it will take some time, but you can try to get excited about what's coming, try to imagine yourself crossing the finish line. Imagine yourself really achieving something for work. And if you can imagine the joy that you will feel at that moment, that can help you go through the process. So I like that you're referring to visualization yeah. on that. I think that's really, really cool. Because I think for someone that is maybe in, and let's just call it a dark place, right? Mm-hmm. Um they need to have a finish line. It, it needs to have a finish line because I can imagine if, if you don't know where to go and you don't know who to talk to because, there's, again, it's not medically recognised. Your boss might not recognise it. Your colleagues might kind of poo-poo you a little bit. Your partner might not be there. So I, the fact you've used visualisation, visualization, I think, is super powerful. How about from a partner point of view? Because, obviously, if you have uh, – or even friends, would you – so let's lose the work piece – Obviously, you don't leave burnout at work. You don't shut the door and go, cool, I'm fine now. But there might be a little kind of peak in your enthusiasm because you've left the shit at work. Yeah. How would you, would you kind of reach out to a few of your inner circle and say, guys, you know, I'm having a, a tough time and, and, and maybe rely on them for encouragement? How would, how would that work? Yes. I think that's important to be open about it with the people that you feel very close to and that you trust, there are still a lot of people that would have the impression of laziness, even close friends. And in the end, when they know you really well, you will change their opinion on what a burnout is and the reality of burnout. Um, and if we have more and more people that are open about how what they experience, then we can finally change the... the general idea uh of around it so have you been burnt out yes oh yeah ever i think (laughs) everybody in academia (laughs) (laughs) has been through some stages at some point yeah yeah (laughs) and as a neuroscientist i find that um the mechanisms uh involved in the brain are fascinating yeah and uh and that's what triggered my passion for it yeah so So how did you do Sorry, John. No, I was going to say, so you got burnt out and then figured and then wanted to study about it. Yeah, absolutely. That's fascinating. And, and <laughs> so for me, that was something extremely positive in yeah. the end. 
And it doesn't need to be... Um, we can try to see it from a positive angle that we know that typically we learn through obstacles, through mm. difficulties. Definitely. And um, in ancient times, we were talking about rites of passages. And uh, a burnout can be one. Uh, you can kind of hit some reality and may rearrange your life. Uh, it will definitely remind you of what matters for you and what does not. And that's that's a really cool opportunity to actually refocus on the good, the good shit, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> and leave the rest. <laughs> that's really interesting because I was going to say my fear is that burnout is the new I'm busy. But actually, if, if the takeout for people is to reframe their why, their purpose, what they like, to seek joy, um, then that is a positive because mm. I, I think more happy people in the world that are getting up and bouncing out of bed in the morning, doing what they love, and hanging out with who they want to hang out with and having conversations they want to have conversations with, it breeds a much better place. Yes. Um, what would you like to see in this space? I mean, again, we're 50 years, we're, we're young, we're in the journey. It seems to be increasing. Um, you're a doctor. What would you like to see? I hope that it's going to be... And um, I would say two things. First, um, a way for people, or it's going to send a message that anything that um, relates to the mind is actually physical. Because in the case of burnout, we can't see changes in brain structures. Um, there's some studies that describe brain shrinking. There definitely are many studies that show a change in brain activity in people that have deep burnout. So this really shows how um, everything that you experience is really linked to your body itself. And it's not just like something magical in black <laughs> box. Because uh, that used to be the idea. Yeah. Anything that it comes from the mind is a bit mystical. So uh, I think th this is the good thing that is coming out from burnout. Because we're talking about something that starts from a disappointment, goes to a sick brain. Mm. And the second is that I hope that it's going to motivate a lot of people not to accept a life that they don't like and to start side hassles, start new projects, start new ventures, uh, engage in new connections, with uh, develop more friendships, um, come out of their little cocoon mm. to join new communities, we used to have a lot of communities. We had families. We had congregation, religious communities. We had villages that were like mm. different type of community. Mm. And we've we've exploded all of that. And now we know actually that a commu uh, belonging to a community really helps your DNA be repaired after stress. And so um, we need to create. Uh, we need to join more communities. We need to develop that sense. And um, if you start a new project, typically you don't start it alone. You start it with someone. <laughs> and and I hope that from a lot of people realizing that they don't like their life, that, 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 that they're not reaching what they want to reach, they're going to get on new projects, new friendships, and we're going to keep on building an even better world for ourselves. Super powerful. I love it. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. With someone that's maybe experiencing burnout that perhaps doesn't have a peer group, um, doesn't have a partner, or doesn't feel comfortable mm -hmm. talking to that, or doesn't feel comfortable talking to their boss, um, are there support lines? Are there places they at the forums? Are there places they can go to seek a bit of comfort and support that you're aware of? So I guess you I have like Beyond Blue Beyond and yeah. things that, yeah, that so maybe talk to more of the, the, the suicide side. but Yeah, Beyond uh, Blue would be uh, really for very like diff different things. Like that. Suicide and mental health as well. It's not only for people right, okay. suicide. It's just for anyone okay. that needs a chat as well, Beyond Blue. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. So um, but I, what <coughs> I would uh, recommend is to find your tribe, find your people. And if you're someone that's shy and like to be at home, it's great to meet people online for mm. any kind of activities. There are lots of people that love gaming and meet new friends, real friends, through gaming. Mm. Uh, there's no shame in that. Uh, like, um, It's about finding others that share something with you, some kind of passion. And if you haven't found yet what you're passionate about, then it's about trying mm. lots of things. <coughs> Just try. Try, yep. try, try. Do you like it? Is, does it bring you joy? No. Next. Thing. Next. 
Yeah. There will be something. For everyone. Yes. <laughs> and if you haven't found it, you just haven't tried enough. Yeah. Love it. Any questions? Are you done? I'm really good here. And Jonathan and look, sound Jonathan. All three I've syllables. All three, all three <laughs> syllables there. I've no. been I've been told insightful. Yeah, yeah. I've and been Jonathan. Told, I've been called my th- full three syllables. I feel like I'm in trouble here. <laughs> no, you've asked a lot of the questions that I've wanted to ask, and um, yeah, a lot of the points that you've raised, or a lot of the things that you've talked about, are pretty much all of the things that I had here. Yeah, really easy to talk to. It's a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. It's a very important topic. Yeah, definitely. Look, it, it's it's super important. And the reason why we wanted to get you on, because as we said at the start, I don't want this to become a new hashtag. Mm. And and as I said, the new busy, the new kind of buzzword in the workplace, because I think it's very real. Um, I've got friends that are on the journey. And it's as someone that uh, is a fixer in my world and a connector and, and just wants to try and put a, a, a solution to everything you kind of can't and it's really hard not to as someone in, in that space so for me it was uh, a very personal podcast to, to bring you on and it's great to see because I know you only, you've only just moved from Sydney you know from from Queensland so it was really good to have you on so I really appreciate your time um I'm going to ask my question that I ask all our guests um so after the last few years we've obviously been in COVID what what is the th- one of the things that you have started that you will continue to do post covid whether it be a ritual whether it be a lifestyle choice what's one of the things that you will continue going through and continue to do hmm. you could have sent me that question before <laughs> <laughs> i can't send you everything no no, no i'm i'm joking i'm trying to think if i have really started something during covid um maybe getting in touch more often with people i love back in europe because i come from europe Mm -hmm. um with lockdowns we've had a lot of uh online video catch-ups with big groups of friends Mm -hmm. and that we were not having as often before and yeah i think i'll Mm. probably try to keep on doing that yeah awesome Awesome. Connection, more connections. Well, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, people, so I have a website, mm-hmm. um, drflorencecotel.com, mm-hmm. and that's I think the best way. Awesome. Can or we LinkedIn? Can we can we ask what the capital L is in Florence? <laughs> yeah. So um, I write my name with uppercase F and uh, lowercase okay, F yeah. and uppercase L. Um, so first, this is a fantastic icebreaker, mm. and everybody starts... Icebreaker at the end of the podcast. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we talked about it before, though. <laughs> you couldn't do it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't do everything. Right. Um, no, and for me, it's a daily reminder that it's possible to challenge the status quo. Brilliant. <laughs> my, my, done. Yeah, mic drop. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on tonight. It's been uh, very inspirational and um, lovely to listen to as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. very Florence much. Cotel. Keep on going with your side hustle and build a lot of joy. Awesome. Thank That's you. Fine.